Hello, my name is Steve Gratton, and I'm a plant water relations specialist here at the University of California, Davis. I'm here to talk about managing salinity in vegetable crop production. Now, all irrigation water contains salts, dissolved minerals, but the type and the amount of the salts varies uh, from source to source. For example, surface waters typically have less salts than groundwater supplies. The main source of salts is comes from either the mineralization of soils, which is a small contributor, but soils are minerals, and when in contact with water, can dissolve into various ions. There's also uh, a, a situation where there's saline shallow, uh, shallow saline water tables can actually encroach into the root system and cause injury as well. This is very typical on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, where if excess irrigation waters were to bring the salt water table up and into the root system, it can cause salinity problems. Uh, the irrigation water itself, of course, has salts, dissolved mineral salts in it, as well as fertilizers. Fertilizer, of course, are nutrients, but nutrient salts are salts, and so they contribute to the overall uh, salt population to cause uh, reduction, or to cause the overall salinity in the, in the, in the profile. And manures and, and compost can also contrib contribute to excess uh, salts in the profile, particularly poultry manure which is a very kind of a hot manure that can, that can actually release a lot of nutrients over a short period of time. So collectively, all these constituents can contribute salts in the crop root system, which can affect the crop. Now, there are certain irrigation waters that contain more salts than others. For example, well waters typically have more than surface waters. Recycled water almost always has a higher salinity than that of, of the, the main source, as well as agricultural drainage water where water is actually passed below the soil, soil profile, collected, drained off into rivers and streams and reused. Now there's different types. These salts then dissolve into water and there's various types. They're broken into different uh, groups, the cations and the anions. The cations are the positively, positively charged constituents and the dominant ones are sodium, calcium, and magnesium. The others are the anions, and the dominant ones are chloride, sulfate, and bicarbonate. So your old irrigation water has these constituents, but what varies is both the concentration of these as well as the different ratios of these different ions. Now also present in the water are smaller concentrations, things like boron in the, in the parts per million range. Now boron um, can be problematic in that there's a small window of concentration between what the plants need for optimal growth, beyond which, which becomes toxic to the plant. Bicarbonate is another constituent that can be in irrigation waters, but typically it doesn't, it's not high enough to be a, a concern unless the pH of the water is really high. And then it can be problematic in terms of like clogging drip emitters. Nitrates, of course, is a nutrient. They're typically not very high concentrations in waters, but in certain places, um, shallow ground waters, um, waste waters from manures, uh, fr from animal feedlots and whatever, can have high levels of nitrates. Potassium, again, is another constituent that's not very high in, in, in irrigation water because it's controlled by the, soils, uh, the solid phase in the soil, uh, but you can have high concentrations in a lot of uh, food pro processing plants, and if that effluent's then used for irrigation. Now, it's important to make a distinction between salinity and sedicity. Salinity is a condition where the salt concentration is sufficiently high to cause a reduction in crop growth or crop quality. And the units that's used to characterize salinity is the electrical conductivity of the water, or EC. Now, that's different than sedicity. Sedicity is a condition where the salts in other words, the cations in, in, this, in the irrigation water are dominated by sodium over calcium magnesium. So in other words, uh, it has a lot more sodium than it does calcium magnesium. This is an also analogous to, to soft water. So sodic water is analogous to, to, uh, to soft water. Now the problem with this in terms of agriculture is that this soft water or sodic water can cause soil aggregates to break apart. And when it does that, then it can cause lots of other problems with poor soil structure, crusting, poor aeration, poor water infiltration, and it can also affect the plants uh, via uh, nutritional imbalances.
Now what's used to characterize the sodicity of the water is called the sodium absorption ratio, or SAR. Basically, it's the ratio of sodium over the square root of the calcium plus magnesium concentration. Now if that's expressed on a, from a soils basis, sodicity is that situation where it's, it's the exchangeable sodium percentage is high enough to cause some structural instability. And the, the ESP is really the percentage of sodium that occupies the total cation, cation exchange capacity in the soil. But it's important to talk about the two different types of EC, the different types of electrical conductivity. There's that EC of the water, and there's the ECE, which is to characterize the electrical conductivity of the saturated soil extract. Now it's important to talk about the latter because all of our crop science, uh, all of our, the literature on, on crop salt tolerance is all defined based on this ECE value. In other words, the average root zone salinity expressed as a saturated soil extract. What exactly is that? Is that soil samples are collected from the field at various depths and at various times to characterize the active root system. They're brought back to the laboratory, they're dried, they're ground, and distilled water is added to these soil samples to the point where they're completely saturated. They're let to sit overnight and then they're extracted. And that extracted water is then, uh, the, the filtrate of that extracted water is then uh, run, uh, the electrical conductivity is run on that, that extracted uh, water. Now there's two different, uh, the salinity affects plants in a couple different major ways. One is called osmotic effects and the other specific ion effects. Now specific ion effects can have two other types of, of, of effects. It could be either ion toxicities or nutritional imbalances or disorders. Now in terms of row crops uh, production, unlike tree crops, typically the ion toxicities uh, tend to be less problematic with the exception of maybe strawberries. Um, but most of the specific ion, ion effects would be more of the nutritional disorder type. That is, of course, if the ion ratios are way out of, out, of, out, of, out of whack, then you could get some specific ion toxicities. Now moving into osmotic effects, all agricultural crops tend to take up water and leave the salts behind, even the mineral salts. It tends to take up some, selectively take up nutrients from the salts, but basically it doesn't take up many of these salts at all. It takes up, you know, the vast majority of what it takes up is the water, and it concentrates all the salts behind. Now as it does that, some plants will have to uh, ad adapt themselves. The, the cells will have to concentrate solutes such that water can freely uh, move from the saline water from the outside inside the cell. Some plants are much more efficient at, at making this adaptation and they tend to be much more tolerant than plants that are much more salt sensitive that are, are less efficient at, at, at making this uh, adjustment. Now here's a, a typical uh, picture. of This is one of celery from a colleague of mine from the U.S. Salinity Laboratory in Riverside. This shows a typical uh, osmotic effect. Now this is celery grown at, at, at four different salinities at 0, 4, 8, and 12 decisiemens per meter. Um, now this is done in solution culture, so it has optimal nutrient. Everything else uh, is optimal. There's no other stress imposed on this plant. This is just an osmotic stress, just salts in the, in, in the solution. And as you can see, as you increase the salinity, the plants just basically become smaller. It's only where you get the really high salt concentration, the 12, where you can get the combination of both osmotic and specific ion toxicity. So what should you do out in the, in the, in the actual field to, 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 to look at salinity over time? Well, this is just a, a, a schematic showing that if you have a particular crop where 90% of the active root zones represent the top three feet, you would want to sample the top, uh, the top foot, middle foot, and bottom foot at ver various times of the season. And for example, in the yellow, I've got uh, different values. For example, early season, I've got one, two, and three, mid season, three, four, and five, and then late season, four, six, and eight, illustrating that as time moves on, the salinity increases, as well as the salinity increases with depth. And if you look at the average root zone salinity, average over space and average over time, then it would be about four decisiemens per meter in this particular scenario. Now, the, the, the literature has a lots of, of values for salt tolerance of various crops. 
And this is the salt tolerance of crops is characterized by looking at the yield potential uh, versus the average root zone salinity, that ECE. Now, as you can see in the, from this particular diagram, uh, strawberries are fairly sensitive to salinity. In other words, you can increase the average root zone salinity up to about one decimeter per meter. Then after that, yields start uh, falling off rather rapidly. So strawberry is very sensitive. Other things like berries, um, you know, blackberries, uh, raspberries are also fairly sensitive. Lettuce um, is a little bit more tolerant, and cabbage is more tolerant than that, and broccoli more tolerant than that. And even more tolerant is like ar artichokes or asparagus. So again, crops, uh, they vary in terms of salt tolerance. Now, one of the important things to look at is that previous slide I showed you where you found out that the average root zone salinity in that, in that uh, illustration or example I showed you was four decimeters per meter. If we look at four decimeters per meter on the x-axis, you can see what kind of problems you'll have for the different various, for the various crops. It would be devastating for strawberries. Uh, berry, berry production would be more than a 50% reduction. Lettuce production, you know, uh, would drop off by 30%. So you can see that that, that, that particular level of salinity will have an impact on different crops. Now one thing that's also important uh, to consider is a lot of the vegetable crops uh, are, can be grown, particularly along the coastal salinas area, uh, areas that have uh, fairly gypsiferous soils. In other words, the soils have a substantial amount of gypsum in it. And if that's the case, then generally there's a shift of salt tolerance to actually, if you look at the ECE values, the crops can tolerate a higher concentration than they would otherwise, based on like the chloride dominated salts for where the guidelines are typically uh, conducted. You can see that strawberries actually shift to the right and they become a little bit more tolerant. So in other words, if you have that same ECE of four, in this particular scenario, you may only be experiencing a 25% reduction in, uh, in yield potential of strawberries. And it gets a little bit uh, more complicated of why that really is. It comes down to the solubility of, of gypsum when you're making the saturated paste. As you make a saturated paste and you add the distilled water, you're essentially dissolving more and more gypsum that wouldn't otherwise be there under a soil water condition, which is really what the roots are ex exposed to or responding to. Now to manage the salinity in the profile, we need to talk about leaching. And the term that, that, this, that we use to, to describe leaching is called the leaching fraction. The leaching fraction is that fraction of water that drains below the profile versus that amount of water that infiltrates into the soil above the profile. So in other words, if you're at home and you have a pot and you take a cup of water and you put it on the pot and you were to catch a quarter of uh, a cup of water that drains below the pot, that would be a leaching fraction of 25%. One cup going on, a, a quarter cup coming below. Now it's also important to look at the, the salt distribution in the profile. This example shows a, a crop water extraction patterns um, that where the root systems is broken down into uh, to four quarters. The top quarter, it's assumed that about 40% of the crop water uptake takes place, the next quarter 30%, uh, the next quarter 20%, and the bottom quarter 10%. Now, this represents about, you know, uh, where maybe 90, 95% of the active roots are. Now, it's important to look at is if you have the same irrigation water salinity under a low leaching fraction, you can see that the salts increase much more rapidly with depth than they do under higher leaching fraction. So what this suggests is that for a particular irrigation water, an ECW, you can have different ECEs, average roots on salinities. And here, this actually illustrates that. Let's say you've got two different salinities, one being an EC of the irrigation water at 0.7, the other at 1.2. Now, if the 0.7 has a lower leaching fraction than the irrigation water at 1.2, over the long term and over steady state conditions, if this were carried out, you could see that these two different irrigation waters, even though they're different salinities, will result in the same average root zone salinity, the ECE of the profile, such so that these, both these irrigation waters would respond, have the same yield potential for a particular crop. 
Now, has anybody ever seen a profile that looks like this? This isn't the typical one that increases with depth, but rather the salinity profile increases up towards the soil surface. This, is there leaching in this particular scenario? The answer to that is no. There's no leaching occurring whatsoever. The leaching fraction in this scenario is zero. And what this illustrates is there may be a saline water table within the top few feet of the profile, such that the salts move up by clap capillary and concentrate at the soil surface. Now that brings me into, into salt movement in the soil profile. It's also important to look at the whole salt distribution in the soil profile. In this typical furrow irrigation, what this shows is that where the irrigation water actually comes in contact with the soil surface, water will move in all different directions. And as it does that, roots will be extracting, again, the pure water, leaving the salts behind. And as the salts keep moving, the salts concentrate. This is an illustration from Washington State that's ancient, but it really is a really uh, nice uh, illustration. This uh, shows um, the kind of water movement pattern. Again, this is like an ant aquarium type of, of profile where you have um, a, a dry soil where you introduce um, irrigation water, you know, kind of like simulated fur furrow. But it also has black dots embedded in the sand illustrating different types of uh, uh, fertilizer applications. And what you can see is that uh, you can show, show us that the whole movement of these particular fertilizers move again in the direction of the water. And you can see that um, between these two furrows, you can have actually salt moving into the same direction, and they can actually be a much higher concentration uh, right below that peak of the bed. This is another example showing uh, a buried drip uh, tubing around eight inches deep. The white circle illustrates a drip tubing coming in and out of the screen. And when the soil profile starts off dry, you get a, uh, a cylindrical wetting pattern that moves away from that buried drip line. And just as the roots start extracting the pure water, salts will be concentrating with various distances away from the drip emitter, as you can see in this illustration. Now, sometimes when it, uh, people talk about uh, row crops and vegetable crops, uh, the questions often brought up is, what about the different stages of, uh, of crop growth? Is there different uh, sensitivities? Well, there's some research out there that, dis, uh, that has been um, published, but there's still a lot of research that hasn't been. But the if information that has been published suggests this, that generally the germination phase tends to be a fairly tolerant stage, uh, very, very tolerant stage to salinity. In other words, these experiments are conducted in, in the petri dishes, and seeds are then um, uh, laid down under the saturated uh, filter paper with different salt solutions. And if you go back there every day, you eventually you can see that salinity delays germination, but eventually a lot of these seeds will germinate. What's, what we don't know is that that phase between germination and emergence um, that seems to be a very critical time between when the seeds germinate in the soil profile to when they actually emerge to the soil surface. The little young fragile germinated seedling now has to endure multiple stresses. The stress of changing temperature at the top part of the profile, changing water content, uh, soil strength, crusting. So there's a lots of stresses that young seedling can endure, but research really hasn't uh, really concentrated on that. What it has shown, though, is between emergence and early seedling development, early vegetative growth tends to be a fairly uh, salt-sensitive growth stage. And then the, the, the maturity typically tends to be much more tolerant. Now let's talk about iron toxicity. I mentioned in the beginning that typically for, for vegetable crops and row crops, iron toxicity is typically not a problem. It's more of an osmotic effect that has to be managed. But strawberries is one exception. Um, strawberries can actually be, be sensitive to both so sodium and chloride and, and boron toxicity. What exactly happens in terms of this toxicity? Well, depending on the, on the variety, the, the salt constituents in, in the soil water can be absorbed by the root and translocated up and then evaporated or transported out, out of, out of the, the leaf. And those particular ions are then, they are, are left to concentrate in those particular leaves. So typically the older leaves will have higher salt concentrations than that of the younger ones. And 
the, the injury or the salt concentration will be much more, uh, much more pronounced around the margins and the tips of these older leaves where the injury occurs. And in fact, when you're trying to go out to a field and try to understand salt toxicity, all salt toxicity patterns have this, this injury pattern where you can look at the youngest leaves which are injury free, whereas the oldest tissues is where the injury takes, takes place. Now there's some values that actually show the chloride tolerance to different strawberries. Again, these are older, older uh, strawberry varieties, but they do illustrate some differences. For example, Lassen and Shasta. What this suggests is that Shasta is much more sensitive. In other words, that the concentration of chloride in the saturated soil extract, if it starts exceeding 175 uh, milligrams per liter, it can start showing injury symptoms, whereas Lassen it would take about over 265 milligrams per liter before toxicity starts occurring. The ones uh, on the right-hand column is chloride in the irrigation water. This is just a relationship between the irrigation water to that of the saturated soil extract. And it's assuming a leaching fraction of about 15 to 20 percent, suggesting that if your irrigation water is around 120 milligrams per liter chloride, for a sensitive strawberry uh, variety, it could be somewhat problematic whereas a more tolerant one, you can get away with a little higher concentration. Now, sometimes people are asked, what about amendments? Are certain things like gypsum applications and sulfuric action, you know, acid applications, do these actually reduce salinity damage? What role do they play? <clears throat> well, the, what role that they play is mainly uh, in terms of trying to improve soil structure. Both gypsum applications and sulfuric ash applications, the goal is to be able to create a soil water situation where you have a lot of free calcium. That free calcium allows the soil structure to form aggregates such that you can prove uh, a situation where you have better drainage, a better infiltration. So that when you do, it comes to leaching, you have a much better uh, soil profile that you can leach the salts that have accumulated. Now sulfuric acid, reacts somewhat differently and it's dependent on that has to have a certain amount of free lime in the soil or calcium carbonate. And that sulfuric acid that gets added to the soil reacts with the calcium carbonate, again making this free calcium. And that's what's doing the, the, the action. Again, it's these constituents working on soil structure, improving the soil structure that then facilitates better leaching. Now, some of the people in early times didn't really understand the benefits of the importance of an adequate calcium supply. We knew that, that calcium helped improve soil structure, but it also calcium helps improve, it helps stabilize the, the membrane structure surrounding the root cells. And what does this, it helps them to be much more selective for taking up the nutrients and other ions they'd like and excluding those uh, they're trying to prevent from taking up. Uh, <clears throat> sodium sensitivity to crops is likely to be more related to the, to the ratio of the sodium to calcium ratio than the actual sodium concentration itself. And the general rule uh, is that if you have the sodium absorption ratio of, of less than three, typically um, sodium is not uh, problematic. Now here's a strange example. This is one of, of artichoke uh, from a colleague of mine down in Riverside, California. Now, <clears throat> this was not grown along coastal areas where a lot of the artichokes are typically grown. This was actually grown more in a desert environment, but it shows the importance of, of, <clears throat> of the impact of, of high levels of sodium on calcium nutrition. Now, this was an experiment done with sodium chloride and calcium chloride added to uh, artichokes, but the sodium to calcium ratio uh, was something like uh, three to one. So the question is, is then, what happens is, is that under high evaporative demand, that even though that you've got fairly favorable ratio of, of sodium to calcium, still you can get a salinity-induced calcium deficiency because the calcium movement actually up to this young, uh, young meristematic area is uh, hampered. And so this is exactly what's happening is that right in the meristematic area of this uh, flower, you're getting a calcium deficiency illustrated by that blackening. So what are some uh, take-home points from this presentation? Well, first of all, uh, different uh, row crops and vegetable crops vary in terms of salt tolerance. Asparagus, 
is tolerant, more tolerant than artichokes, which is more tolerant than broccoli, more tolerant than cabbage, which is more tolerant than lettuce, and which is more tolerant than berries. And we have, not in this illustration, but you can contact me for, for much more detailed uh, tables that give a, a much more extensive listing of different salt tolerance of different crops. Strawberries are sensitive to chloride, but it also depends on the variety. Some soils, for example, with the ECE of greater than one, will start reducing the yield potentials of strawberries. But these experiments were pretty much done in chloride-dominated soils. In gypsiferous soils, where you have a lot of free calcium uh, sulfate, then uh, the plants can typically to tolerate somewhere in the neighborhood between one to a few uh, decisiemens per more than they would otherwise. It's also important during the, the, the course of the year to make, take soil samples, take water samples, soil samples, and plant tissue samples at critical times during the season. Typically, the soil salinity and the, and the, uh, and, and the concentrations in the leaf tissue will increase later in the season. Amendments to fr make free calcium, the calcium 2 plus, are effective at, at, uh, when, when free calcium is limiting. So in other words, Gypsum applications are effective when you don't have enough free calcium there. If you already have enough there, then adding gypsum isn't going to help. Similarly, if you have enough, you know, a lot of calcium carbonate there, as long as you've got some free calcium, adding acids is not going to be as effective as it would be if you don't have much free calcium. Leaching in the drip lines occurs under drip, uh, uh, under the, right below the drip line, but assaults tend to accumulate bef uh, in between. So in other words, this whole leaching fraction concept in drip irrigation is somewhat complicated in the sense that you have leaching below the drip, drip system, but, uh, but actually in between them you can have a concentration of salts. Um, and you, what you want to do is, is to leach the profile in the winter when the evaporative demand is low, or at certain times of the year when the salinity in the, in the, in the active root zone becomes high enough to critical levels, those levels which I, I showed you in, the, in that one graph. Now this is just a general overview of salinity and the salinity management of vegetable row crops. My email address is S as in Steve, R as in Robert, last name is Grattan, G-R-A-T-T-A-N at ucdavis.edu. Feel free to ask any questions or email questions um, concerning any, any part of this presentation or anything related to salinity management. Thank you.